Um, thanks very much for asking me, uh, colleagues. Um, I work in Australia, and I'm, I'm visiting briefly. The, uh, um, the mention of Epping was because I came over in August when my elder daughter had a baby, and uh, I've turned up now. I've not had to do anything in between, and she's turned from a newborn into this gorgeous four-month-old smiley thing, and I've had to do nothing. So I strongly recommend... <laughs> that kind of activity in between. Um, so I will tell you a little bit more about what I'm doing at the moment, but um, I'm actually going to give you a framework <coughs> because you should know that I believe that all of us are at this extraordinary moment in the history of education. Um, and we have an incredible plethora of choices. Um, to undertake. Can everyone hear me okay? Um, and I think that sometimes if you have too much choice, you know, you can think, oh, I just haven't got time for all of this and do what you've always done. So I've tried to divide it up and I'm going to show you a little bit of insight from each of these quadrants and some of the choices that you have to take yourself forward. So I'm hoping that you'll all pick at least something from this that's meaningful for your practice, for your context, for your students, um, that you could actually go away and do um, after today. So I'm crossing my fingers. So, And I'm, I'm going to ask you at various points whether I've been successful in that. <coughs> so um, I was originally a business school academic worked for the OU Business School for a lot of years. And business school academics, I know there might be a few here, love two by two matrices because we can understand them. Okay, so this is what this is and um, it's, it's broadly based on, you know, Boston and hands off matrix, that's our idea, but adapted to um, learning and technology and this amazing position we're in in the world of education. Um, at this moment as we head to Christmas 2012 and into 2013. So we're heading towards the middle of the second decade of the 21st century. I'm sure you've noticed that, but I just think it's worth thinking about. So the way you read this is what goes up this side is the constant attempt to do things better um, in the service of some mission or objective. Mm -hmm. You know, it might be retention, it might be, you know, the university's new strategy or whatever. We've always got somewhere else that we're being <coughs> guided towards. Um, and there's two ways, two main ways of looking at this. I mean, we've got an extraordinary amount that we're already doing, doing well, that we know we could do a bit better, we could do it a little bit differently and so on. And we know that we could do a huge amount, for example, with our VLE. Um, but actually, if you only do that, um, you're not gonna be at the forefront of everything. You're not gonna be the forefront, actually, of anything very much, because every other university in the world is trying to do the same. So it's valid, it's worth doing. You've got the context around you, the students you know, that you're teaching and, um, at any one time. And that's really what's down that bottom corner there. But of course, what new technologies and new pedagogies give us is also the opportunity to go out and do something different that we haven't done before. And so that's what's at the top. So it's the idea that we might want to try something different. Um, and I'm going to show you a couple of examples of things <coughs> I've been involved in like that. Um, now, in the early years of this century, there were some huge failures associated with e-learning and the use of technologies. I mean, some of them you will remember, you know, the UK e-university, for example, um, um, the NHS university would be another and some of them are enormous and some of them are big commercial failures some of them were huge consortia that got together 
where you would have thought that somebody would learn from it. For example, there was one that put together the Smithsonian um, Institute with the British Library, and still they failed to attract any students. And you'd think these days somebody would learn that you know, content is not king, especially with all the MOOCs around and, and so on. Um, but actually, there were probably hundreds, if not thousands, um, more failures that caused just as much waste of money and many tears um, in that time. Now, if you look at those, and there are some reports around if you can stand reading about failure, I quite like it because I think it's quite creative how not to do things. Um, there, there's, there's one particular characteristic that will stand out for you, and that is that if you want to go out to a, a truly new mission or a new market for you, something you haven't grown up with, that you do actually need to do it with the kind of organisational structures, the pedagogical approaches, and the technologies that you're familiar with. So in other words, don't innovate across too many things at once. Now, we're now at the point where we have well-established VLEs. We know an enormous amount about teaching online. Um, and so that's what that is up there. So you can imagine that what's in that bit is really rather different from an adaptive approach to improving what we're doing already. So everybody get the idea of what's on the left? What's on the right is really rather different. <clears throat> So, what you see on the green one, oh, I don't know if you can read that, it says established programs responding to new technologies, <coughs> down in the bottom uh, right there. Um, now, of course you know, and you better somebody close Rob's ears up, that the vast majority of technologies that you will be using in the future for learning and teaching are not going to be owned and controlled by the university. <coughs> okay, most of them, I'll have to some water, I think. Oh, sorry. It's because I had a biscuit before. <laughs> um, most of them um, have been produced, thank you, for entertainment purposes, <coughs> for business purposes, um, for a whole range of opportunities for social networking and very very few of them will have any sort of pedagogical approach built in. Now you can see that's a problem but you can also see it's a huge opportunity because actually you know very much more about pedagogical approaches than the technology developers do. So in that sense you can see it as an opportunity. Now it throws up different challenges bring your own devices one, the university is going to have to shift some of its resources to providing for a plethora of different mobile devices instead of providing fixed labs which are safe and secure. So there are going to be some serious changes in that area. But in terms of learning design and what we can do with students, <laughs> um, I'm going to show you some ideas of how you could be experimenting <coughs> and prototyping now, you don't have to move the whole, whole organisation to that yet, but you do need to be experimenting with it. You do need to be starting out with it. And, of course, up the top there, the yellow one, um, if you did all of that, you would still be behind in a year or two. That's why I'm saying it's extraordinary time. Um, because there's all sorts of things coming over the horizon and I've just picked a few to show you that I think may be of particular interest to you here in Northampton and the students you're working with and the subjects that you're teaching. Um, and some of you at least need to be hitching the ride on this. Now obviously that's the riskier part of it. Um, but I'm not talking about you developing the technologies, I'm talking about you engaging with the people who are so that you actually find your pedagogical opportunities. So do you get the general idea of this? Okay, if you're easily scared, fasten your seatbelt, the exit is over there. So I'm gonna start with some examples. Now, for this one, um, you've got blackboard here, you call it something else? Nile. No. Nile, but you know what I mean. Um, 
there are um, probably two main approaches to VLEs throughout the world, and including Australia. Um, one is the proprietary ones like Blackboard, and then there's the approach to Moodle. They all do more or less the same sort of thing. Um, the, the Moodle, some academics like better because um, it's open source, but it needs a very different support internally. Blackboard, you're dealing with a proprietary provider. So, to be honest, it doesn't make a lot of difference. My advice is do not put your energy into that. Leave the IT people to provide you with the best possible service they can and work out how to turn it into what you want. There is an upgrade coming. I've just checked and you're going to get it next year. Um, it's got a few functions in that a lot of us have been asking for for about eight or nine years now, but they're finally put in. Um, but um, interestingly, it has got a much more modern look and feel to the interface. So it looks a bit Facebooky. In other words, you can see who you're working with and so on. And that, I think, is a very good thing. So even if you don't dramatically change what you're doing, the students will feel more comfortable with it. There's a huge amount of research that students spend very much less time in the VLE than they do in any other social network, because that's essentially what it is. So anything that makes it look more familiar seems to me a good thing, because it won't look quite so familiar to us. So make sure you go and turn up at any training and development that's offered. Um, but this is something what it will look like, and you can see you've got the sort of pictures and so on. Um, and the other good thing is that Blackboard are now making sure that the rather clunky stuff that was working on a whole range of mobile devices is going to look much better. <coughs> so I think from now onwards you can assume that students don't have to be by a tethered computer in order to have this. You can start assuming it can interact you know, with the ambient learning environment in all sorts of different ways. So I think... You know, those are the kinds of things that you can assume are coming during 2013. I hope that's right, Rob. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think at the moment you've got, you know, considering Blackboard Collaborate, this is a virtual classroom. Um, there are other virtual classrooms, you know, it doesn't have to be this one. I've chosen to go with this. It used to be called Illuminate. People remember it as that. I liked it. I've always used it. We used it at Leicester. We've used it lots of times. There's other ones you can use, but it does seem to integrate pretty well in the new Blackboard. So for me, <coughs> if it's easier for me to integrate it, then I'll have it, you know. So, um, and this is a really good way of providing some synchronous work along with the much more asynchronous work that you get in the VLE. Um, and also, you can use it so in a more blended mode, so you've got students both co-located and online. Um, um, I'm about to publish a, a book that's actually got quite a lot of advice of how to do that and I can very happily send you that chapter if any of you want to have a, a go at that. I'm sure most of you are familiar with this kind of idea, um, but it does tend to take you a while to actually work out the learning design. Um, so there's all this coming, we're still down in this black one as you can see. The other thing I just want to mention briefly, um, is that we're now getting a lot more understanding from the digital world, we've been doing it long enough now, for it to influence the kind of physical spaces we provide, both for students and for staff. Um, and I've just had a little research project going in Melbourne, across the seven universities in Melbourne, and these are some of the things that you know, they're starting to do. We do know that you build your environment and then the environment influences you. So it's time to stand up and ask for different kinds of spaces for teaching. And as long as you've got a good wireless network, you don't have to have anything fixed. The only thing you need a good um, <coughs> a bank of power, <laughs> you know. But apart from that, so I think if you get any opportunity to influence the physical environment on campuses, <coughs> then it's particularly worthwhile. And that's my favourite table in the front there, in all the whole world. It's all I said I wanted for Christmas, and they've just bought me one. Um, and this is the Microsoft Touch table. And really, it's pretty similar to what you do with your iPad. You 
you know, you put software on. It's great for brainstorming. When you do copy DMs, it's perfect for doing storyboards and all that sort of thing. But of course, you, everyone stands <coughs> around. You're standing and you do it in a group. Um, and they're not terribly expensive. And I'm, I'm not getting any commission on this. But, um, but I've got it for staff at the moment. And it's just been a great hit. You know, sometimes you just hit something and people kind of get the idea. So I think I'm lobbying now. I'm lobbying that you should all have one of these, preferably in your own offices. So, <laughs> so to get the kind of idea of that one. So it's what you've got around you, constantly improving. I'm sure there's at least one thing in there for everyone that you could do. Okay. So do you, you still with me? Everyone's... Okay, I'm going to look at this one now. Um... Okay, um, I've got two Australian examples for you here. Um, now, the university I work for is called Swinburne, University of Technology. It's really been a very much a campus-based. I mean, I think if you had them on the, um, the end of the lecture, lecturers thing, um, they would all say, really, there's any other way, you know? But, um, and we've got lovely campuses. You know, we're sort of um, in urban Melbourne, it's very green, everybody sits outside, but, you know, they're still building 500-seater <coughs> lecture places. Um, and various people before I arrived had tried to change this. Um, but in the end, um, we thought we needed to be part of the digital revolution and find a way of doing it. And the way we did it um, is we set up a new... Um, or separate organisation, um, which is half owned by an Australian listed public company called Seek, who are a job search company. Key thing about them is they've really got a very clear idea of what students want to study because they know exactly what jobs they're going for. So it's a real win win situation. You know how hard it is to predict how many students are going to register even for the next semester, let alone three years' time. Well, they've got, this is one way of finding out. So it's just a little tip there. Um, and 50% owned by Swinburne. Now, they're Swinburne students. They have all the regular <coughs> entry requirements, no open entry. They're on programmes. In Australia, you've still got government funding for such things. Um, <laughs> And it's all the, all the regular QA and the same identical assessments as on the on-campus version. So in other words, we don't have to credit them elsewhere. They're Swinburne students, and in fact, they can move interchangeably between the campus and the entirely digital experience. Uh, the pedagogical approach is a well-researched approach. Um, it's based on my work going back um, nearly 20 years now to the Open University. It has people trained as e-moderators to do the teaching online. But all the courses are entirely digital <coughs> experience. And I could bore you and tell you about the demands and the joys of actually doing this. But anyway, we admitted our first students in March this year. We've got three teaching periods a year. So we've just admitted the third transfer students. Shock horror. We're above target on student numbers, and retention and achievement is higher than the campus students. So it can be done. It can be done. Um, and interestingly, <coughs> when you hear uh, more from Ali and me about the Carpe Diem approach to learning design, the whole thing has been done through Carpe Diem, which is a joint <coughs> approach um, to learning design with technologists, academics, um, and pedagogical facilitators. So it can produce something that students can really, really relate to. So that's that one. The other one um, is Open Universities Australia. Um, there's not really anything like this that I'm familiar with in the university sector <coughs> at the moment. And it's not really an open university for Australia in the same way as our own open university works. Um, it's actually a consortium of universities, of which my university, Swinburne, is one. Um, and they offer what we would call module by module by module, <coughs> that you can build up into a degree. Um, but completely open entry. 
absolutely no requirement to come in at all. And again, entirely digital. And of course, what the Open University um, Australia does is provide the shop front for that. And so this terrible problem, if you want to offer open entry, to reach, you know, in this case, an Australia-wide market, that could be a worldwide market, is dealt with by a very slick marketing operation. And then the students come through and are supported by us in the, the regular way. Um, and some of the academics at Swinburne thought that when we offered Swinburne online, which was, you know, regular entry requirements, program-based stuff, it would kill off our OUA open entry work. Not the case. Despite the fact we have two and a half thousand students now on Swinburne online, the open entry <coughs> through Open Aus um, Universities Australia has increased by 33% to 25,000 uh, module registrations this year. So what I've learnt from this, I'm talking about Australia, I can't give you equivalent figures because I wouldn't be able to get them for the UK, but there is an enormous market for a variety of different online courses in the world at the moment. Ex extraordinary. I mean, who would have thought that in one country we could have increased students by thousands and thousands and thousands by just offering really good online courses? And nor did it detract from all the regular applicants on the campus. So what I'm saying is that don't think these spaces have all been occupied. They haven't. You know, there's still a great opportunity for doing it right. So I'm just going to stop just for those first two. We're looking at the moment, if you remember, down the left-hand side, before I go to the even more scary stuff on the right. Any comments or questions? <coughs> Jenny, Susie Rogers from the University yes, of Auckland, South Wales. Yeah. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you so much, everyone, for the invite. Um, you mentioned very carefully, I think, and um, in your book, you talk about the, um, the swimmers, the wavers, and the drowns. Now, just now, a few minutes ago, you said that your online learning is um, supported by, and I listened very, very carefully, pedagogical facilitators. <coughs> sure. Now, yeah. are they human beings as e-moderators, or are they software avatars? Right, okay. <laughs> now, both at Swinburne Online and Open Universities Australia, they're, they're moderators, <coughs> and they're trained through the five-stage model and all the skills that are in the book. Um, at Swinburne Online, they're called e-learning advisors. Um, and they are academics who are actually trained to teach online. And at Swinburne Online, because we were starting the organisation off from scratch, um, nobody teaches online unless they have got advanced demoderating skills and they can demonstrate them. Um, and I think that's been one of the features of the whole that's made a difference. Um, but because Swinburne Online is, um, has also been set up as a separate company, they've also got a, a very strong helpline um, to help students with library access technology and so on, which is run completely separately. And so it does actually give them, the moderators the chance to do what they need to do and not deal with all the other 101 things that often you get involved in. Um, Open Universities Australia it is the same. They're actually trained through the moderating courses to teach online. And I think the more we understand different learning design, the more we understand the need to train people to make the most of that learning design. Um, otherwise, they spend too much time at it and get pretty fed up, really, quite quickly. So I hope that briefly answers your Wonderful. questions. Yes, Susan. thank you very much. <coughs> Shall I keep going? Anyone else? Yeah. OK, we're back to this. I'm going to look at this one now. Um, now, there's so much you can do with this, but I'm going to very briefly um, go through, through three areas that I think are probably most relevant to you at the moment. The one is all the opportunities associated with mobility. And this can be anything from simply enabling students <coughs> to have their regular learning 
on a mobile device so it's more flexible and more integrated while they're travelling or at work or right the way through to much more sophisticated approaches. Digital connectedness, I'm just going to say a little bit about that. Um, and then I'm going to show you 20 social media technologies that have been used to develop online activities for students and we know it will work. Um, and I'm going to challenge you, I'm going to talk quickly and I'm going to challenge you and test you on the end, okay? <laughs> and open education resources, you know, you know that you're going to start taking Northampton down this route with the open Northampton projects. This is a wonderful thing to do and it will position you very, in a very important place um, in the world, not only the UK but throughout the world. And it gives you the opportunities to do a whole range of innovative things at reasonably low cost. So you do need to get involved in, in getting your work and your materials into OER format so that you can actually do the much more exciting stuff like MOOCs and so on. Okay, ready? Um, first of all, reading. Um, there's a whole range of fantastic uh, readers. I know that I'm getting the new Kindle for Christmas and I use it almost entirely for leisure reading, but it's great for academic reading as well. And it does dramatically uh, reduce both student and staff costs. Start off by putting your university materials on rather than trying to change the publishing industry's attitude towards this. But there are quite a few people, and again, um, this is from experience, Pearson seem to be the best place to start, who have seriously got that they're going to have to change their business model and work with this quite differently. Um, we've, we've found that Pearson's for Swinburne Online has been our best bet so far. Now, a lot of the others, McGraw-Hill and others, I think are coming along and recognising they've got to go beyond giving you a bit of content that you can put into Blackboard, you know. So, you know, that it is in the process of change. So if you've been very put off by the publisher's attitude towards both openness and electronic publishing, there's an opportunity now to try and do something with this. Um, and of course, um, absolutely fantastic mobile apps. Um, you know, there's just a few examples here, but certainly with both on campus and, and online students at Swinburne, we're using all of these in our courses and having great fun with them. They're stuff that would take you years to develop yourself. Um, of course, they're variable quality, but they're very cheap for you to get for yourself and to try out. Um, and it really does enable you to flip the way you're doing things. You no longer have to spend ages explaining a scientific principle or whatever. Um, and I love sort of some of the collaborative elements of them, like the music, which I'll say more about. So at least consider, if you remember nothing from this talk, go and find the best mobile app for your subject area after today. Um, and, you know, there's so much that you can, your university can do to create your own ecosystem around it. And here's some examples, so look this up. Now, digital connectedness. Um, I mean, I looked at this from the point of view of the Australian population, which is nearly 23 million, though, as you know, over a vast land area. Um, whereas Facebook is now close to 1 billion active participants. <coughs> so if Facebook were a country, it would be the third largest in the world. And that's what its land mass looks like down there. Um, so whatever you think about Facebook, um, you really do need to consider um, whether your students, who will almost certainly be on there, and it is starting to change from just young undergraduates now as well, or whether one of the equivalents, like LinkedIn, which is more professional, or a range of others, you know, you really can do something with it. Um, for example, you can create Facebook groups, you can even have a separate identity on Facebook. It doesn't have to link with family and friends, and, and students can too. And it's a very cheap and easy way of getting in and just experimenting. We're providing a Facebook group 
over a period of time for your learners, whether they're on campus or online. Um, and, you know, this holy grail of search for engagement, this is one way of doing it. Okay, so why not try? The sky won't fall if it goes wrong, but you might just learn something from doing it. Um, okay, I'm going to talk about these fairly quickly. Now these, I'm going to give you 20 technologies, uh, social media technologies, um, grouped into types. Um, and I'll leave this with you so you can look at it later um, and critique it. And I've divided them into those that are really good for promoting students working together, whether it's in a blend or entirely digital, <coughs> and those that are great for providing some sort of material <coughs> or content in, or a spark to start a dialogue, none of which you have to write or produce. Okay. Um, so first there's wikis. Wikis are really, really good and using the activities and um, Ali has pioneered some of this work and, and we'll show you how to do that. And there's lots you can use. You can get one in Blackboard if you like or there's lots of others. Voice boards, these are like asynchronous text-based voice boards but you use them um, as voice so you attach a little voice file. Great fun, might be useful if you're doing language learning, but also the human voice adds a great deal of value, as you would have found from your podcast <coughs> projects anyway. Blogs, absolutely great to get students doing blogs. They write more, they're sequential, they can use them to look back over their course. There's been a lot of success <coughs> in using blogs, actually to get students engaged. Micro blogs, there's Twitter the main one, but there are some others. Huge interest at the moment in using Twitter. And interestingly, a lot of the young undergraduates don't use it. So you find that you can introduce it to them and doing it for what you want. It's also really good for the moderators that Susie was talking about. Um, because obviously using the hashtags, are you, as you are for this conference, it's so easy to collect up everyone's contribution and see actually what's happening. It does save you a lot of time. If you're looking for class contribution, either within <coughs> the classroom, the lecture theatre, or online, it works just as well for both. Text messaging, um, there's quite a lot of stuff, and actually Blackboard is selling one called Connect now, um, where from within Blackboard and the Blackboard groups, you can actually use text messaging for all sorts of different things. It's also great um, because students are so used to it, and we are often ourselves as well. Multi-user games, maybe you wouldn't want them doing games, but you'll find like some the Camelot Battle for, Battle for the North <coughs> I've been using with a student group. It teaches them to work in teams, it teaches them to um, understand about logistics. You don't have to design any multimedia content. You can keep it bounded, you can do it over a few weeks. And I've been completely astonished at the engagement <coughs> of that. Um, I've actually had it in a teacher education course that I've been running. It's been really brilliant. Um, 3D multi-user virtual worlds. Second Life is the one you will have heard of. It's dropped off of popularity in the general population, but there's, it's still being used by educators throughout the world for a whole range of things. And there is an open source version if you'd rather not use the proprietary one. Synchronous virtual classrooms, I've already said something about Collaborate, but here are some of the others. But even if you use Skype, you know, do actually try the presentation over the web because it has a completely different feel about it. Um, this is a, um, a really important area that you might not know about. There's some wonderful stuff now on mind mapping and concept mapping, and we found an awful lot of activities work really, really well in this area and there's lots of them up there and of course social networking I've, I've mentioned Facebook and LinkedIn there's lots of others as well if you don't want to use Facebook um, because you don't like the idea of, of, of Facebook then you can use others but I've actually tried all of these and I've come back to Facebook I think it's the easiest mm -hmm. one to use get the idea yeah something for everybody I haven't finished uh, these are, are more to do with finding content, although I tend to use them as a spark to start a dialogue, 
or enabling students to create their own contributions. Um, so there's crowd different wikis like Wikipedia and there's others like Formspring. Okay, we know they're formed in a different way to the Encyclopedia Britannica or our own writing, but as long as you teach them to evaluate and they understand where it's coming from, it's absolutely fine. And when you come to linking it into Blackboard, it's very stable, so you only have to put a link in. It's all Creative Commons, so you can use it all freely as well. Social bookmarking, loads of stuff here. Um, Delicious is probably in... Um, probably the best known, but you know, really from the very beginning of your course, have everyone a bookmark something on their journey and you'll have wonderful footprints for them to look back for revision and to take forward to build on for the next course. You'll really be creating your own special Wikipedia. Um, recommendations and contributions. This is the idea um, of collecting up recommendations. Uh, as If you haven't looked at um, um, pin interest, you'll, you'll find that it's, it's largely, if you look at the pages based on people recommending their favourite brands and all that sort of thing, or posting their photographs. But in actual fact, I've seen people use it spectacularly successfully. Um, I, the one I've seen recently is in a futures course to look at all the future technologies coming up. Um, okay, I think that's probably mine. Um, now, the whole idea of massive contributions and collections, um, a, fl a flicker is huge, but you do need to make sure that you go in, into the advanced search and tick the Creative Commons books uh, box so that you get everything that you can use freely. YouTube also has Creative Commons, but if you link to a YouTube video, you've got no problem about copyright. Um, and there's lots of others. Um, you know, if you're interested, for example, the Business School Entrepreneurial Ideas Kickstarter, Khan Academy, some people think it's absolutely dreadful, but it's definitely worth uh, a look in there. TED would be another one, probably. So, but it, it, you don't need to present it to students as the ultimate to replace what you're offering them. You need to present them in such a way that they evaluate um, what's on there. Syndication and update, um, obviously this is the RSS feed idea. It's getting easier and easier to set this up. If you're not used to it, you might need a little bit of technical help. Um, but you do really need to get things like trap it in there. So, and this is a very, very easy way of constantly refreshing your course on a daily basis without having to put anything in there yourself. Um, document collaboration, most of you probably tried Google Docs at some time. It's pretty weird when you first start to use it because there's multiple editing. There's lots of others, um, but do start to encourage students to share their work in this way and teach them how to reference and support properly because that's the kind of way that you identify and avoid plagiarism. Do you know Stumble Upon? You come across this. It's pretty weird. It's mostly American stuff. And, um, but you just set up what you're interested in. Every time you click, you get a random website that's got something to do with that. <laughs> you just have to try it, honestly. Uh, especially if, you've got, if you're bored one day, it's great. Um, e portfolios. Have you got an e portfolio here? Yep. Yeah, yep. what have you got? We've got uh, one by. Um, what was it, Sir Dr. Prof? Um, oh, edge edge blogs. Blogs. oh, the Edge Blog one. Yeah. yeah, it's very popular actually. Yeah. yeah. Okay, e portfolios are great. I think we need to move much more towards, as you digitalise your courses, whether it's in Blend or entirely online, you also need to digitalise assessment. <coughs> and this, uh, using e portfolios, is a great way of doing that because you can actually have them as private um, or you can have them exposed to. Uh, teachers for assessment purposes or feedback purposes um, and some of them like Pebble Pad students can take them with them if they move on. Mobile apps I've already said something about but um, this means that you will need to change probably university policies of what people can use rather than think that you're going to be able to secure them behind the preferred um, uh, computer labs on campus. 
and location-based imaging, you know, they are just so wonderful for sharing, for views, and, you know, there, there's one or two others, but obviously Google Earth and Google Street View are way ahead of the pack on this, but there will be a lot more. There will be a lot more. And you can also um, look at some of the apps for looking at the sky and those sorts of things. Now, has everybody seen something there they might just consider? Yep, yeah, right, okay, I'm happy. I'm going to move on. Um, Wikipedia, I've mentioned, that's what Flickr looks like, Open Educational Sources. Go up to the advanced search box here and tip the Creative Commons and then you know you can actually download the picture and use it for educational purposes. Um, similarly, these are all things that I found um, as uh, videos on YouTube. Did you get the idea of that one? Yeah? Uh, and was it live? Shall I go on to the last one? Yeah, okay. Uh, okay. Um, you really do need to think, at least have on your radar, what's coming over the horizon. Now, very little of it will be specifically for educational purposes. Very, very little of it. It's a matter of spotting something that might be relevant for your subject and experimenting with it, prototyping it. It's really important to prototype the educational purpose while you've got students around you to give feedback because that's the way it works with the prototype that you get immediate feedback from the context that you're in. Um, so have a look at the Horizon reports. Do you know about them? There's hundreds of them now. So you can see one's for Europe, one's for STEM subjects, one for this, one for that. But at the moment, they're all looking pretty much at things like mobile apps, tablet computing, game-based learning, serious games, learning analytics. I'm going to say a bit more about that. And then over the horizon, the idea that the internet is ubiquitous and it's going to be embedded in everything. Um, they're not always right. It's done by kind of a Delphi thing, so it's people's opinions. Um, but it does give you a view of, of what the you know, up-and-coming landscape looks like. And they keep <coughs> published them for different countries or different subjects or different levels of education. So, you know, for example, if you're involved in teacher education, it's a great thing to get you know, future teachers discussing. Um, <coughs> MOOCs. Who hasn't heard of MOOCs recently? <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, well, what MOOCs are, are using open educational resources <coughs> to display uh, either a university or a university department and offering learning for free around the world. And they, they frequently attract literally thousands <coughs> and thousands. Now, within my department at Swinburne, 10 of us decided we'd all start a MOOC at the same time on subjects we knew nothing about. So I'd like to tell you I'm an expert on genetics now, but unfortunately it didn't happen. <coughs> um, but you must try them because there are very few of them have got decent pedagogy in them. They are just to sort of push it out. Um, and uh, most people don't complete them. Um, but that there's huge interest in whether this is going to transform the future for higher education. Um, and, you know, vice-chancellors are very interested because they heard one or two proverbs and the like in the United States got sacked because they didn't have one. Um, so you're bound to be asked about this sooner or later. Um, they, I mean, they are altruistic in the sense they make... Um, university learning available. The best one, known ones, of course, um, have been around for quite some time, MIT and um, the Open Universities one. But now there's companies like Coursera, which is what I'm showing you here, are actually providing the portal, putting them together. So if you go on the Coursera site, it's course with RA at the end, .org, I think it is. Um, then and have a look at your subject if you want to scare yourself 
um, because you'll find there's loads of very high-end universities offering something in this. And what it does, in, you can have that material, by the way, if you want to use it for your own course. There's nothing to stop you registering it. Um, but what it does do is make you think really very differently about the pedagogical design of your own course to make sure that you are taking students with you, it is equitable, it is fair, that how the assessment and teaching is built in. So do have a look around because it does spark this idea. <coughs> this is not going to go away. There's people still trying to work out how they're going to credit these courses, what the business models are. Uh, I'm pretty certain they're here to stay, so we need to understand them, that's for sure. Um, there's yet more coming over the horizon, this augmenting reality idea, and I've given you a couple of examples here, um, and if you look at how stuff works, augmenting reality, there's loads more. Wearable computing, this one up the top here, I've put, I think, uh, I think it's that one down there, anyway, have a look at that. What this is, is young, the young guys walking along like this, and they've got T-shirts with a computer in their T-shirt, okay? And this is to do with the technology becoming bendable, thin and bendable, so you can put it into a fabric. Um, and it's coming, there's people working on that. Um, but it's also interactive to the ambient environment, so when they see some smart young chicks walking along the... Uh, Computer flashes a heart. Okay, it's incredibly nap, but you must watch it nevertheless. Um, Google Glass is another thing. So your com computer is actually in your specs, and it's actually giving you additional information about what's around. I'm pretty certain um, that that might well make it to us buying those things. Um, and there's all the other things, those of you in healthcare, for example, I mean, it, this is to do with constant monitoring of people in dangerous situations. Um, so there's a whole range of things and, and, you know, that are about wearable computing. Nobody's actually saying, for example, that, you know, you're going to take a pill and have you then be awarded your degree. Um, but it's certainly, um, these things, like so many things, like sat nerves and so on, coming down in price and are going to dramatically change the way we think about the future for learning. And a lot of your subjects, I think, you know, some of this could be of serious interest. Um, have you heard of 3D printing? Yeah? No, some people have. Yeah. Right, you need to watch the video because I might not explain this properly, but essentially it's the idea that the design of something is built into the printer, okay, and then it prints out the object, so it's going to transform design, you know, which is really obviously an important area for Northampton. Um, and I did see at the conference I was in Berlin last week, I did see this all working. So there are prototypes of it, all different things that people are printing out. And they're talking about printing out cars and things. But you can see the video here of this violin, which is printed out and then it did play. You know, so that's the kind of thing that we're talking about. Um, and there's quite a lot in the press about it at the moment because it's terribly expensive. But if it takes off and it works, it really is going to be another transformation for some industries, I think, in many ways. So, <coughs> that's what I've shown you. I'm just going to stop and see if there's any comments or questions on the right-hand side, yeah. the new approaches, the ways we need to harness, if you like, um, both what's available to us in social and mobile media and what's coming over the horizon to trial and prototype in our own courses. Any comments or questions on those? Can I ask you one, Julie? Yes. Uh, your five-step model, activity, Z-moderation, yeah. training, uh, among other things, they provide a personalised uh, experience to learners and um, a very scaffolded experience to each yeah. learner. Yeah. Uh, how do you see the extrapolation of that to these access MOOCs uh, where 
access seems to be the driver yeah, rather than... Yeah. Well, as far as I know, no one has tried the five-stage model apart from the one I think that you know about, um, um, which is this sort of open new approach where they have been trying to adapt the five-stage model to that. But at the moment, uh, the, the, what, everything, there's 10 of us registered on all different ones, and they're all largely content with a discussion board that only a few people take part in. Um, and we know that unless you scaffold it and build the interaction, then that's what will happen. I mean, that's what we were doing 10, 15 years ago. So there is a risk that it will, you know, reduce back to that. So it's, it's not equitable and it's not fair in some of the ways people are suggesting, because if you can't learn from it, it's not fair. So, yeah. Susie, yeah. did you have a... Um, I did. I'm following up to Dr. Yeah, Armini um, because the differentiation of student learning yes. on these MOOCs, it, it, it doesn't exist. No. So if pedagogical leaders in the university have ways of enhancing such MOOCs, mm. is there any sort of copyright problem or something like no, that no, in no. all three? No, no. I don't think so. No, I mean, if the materials are, are already established as Creative Commons, then, you know, no. I mean, there's nothing to stop you adding human value to it, nothing at all. And that, and that will have to happen if they're going to sustain, I suspect. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, it was another question about... Sorry, I think... No, it's gone. Yeah, no, yeah. no, it's another question about the MOOCs, really. Very parochial yeah. question, in a way. Um, I've come across them, though, not by that name. I think it's Stanford University in the USA has got yes. them, hasn't it? Um, I mean, at the moment, there's two mini questions, really. One is, is one of their chief uses currently marketing for the university, that it's putting all that stuff out there and drawing attention to its own yeah. brand? That's sort of one question. And the other one is just, you know, out of interest. What does the acronym stand for? Because it's uh, massive like Open Online Courses right. is MOOCs. I've been running a souk, a small open <laughs> online course. <laughs> 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 um, with 10 people, really just to try out some of the things, you know, that Ali and Susie are referring to, to see actually how you can do that. And it's actually working quite well, but I only had 10 people on my wikitivity, so I'm not really sure. But yeah, <coughs> yeah but there are organisations, um, I think I've got all, most of the links in here, if not Ali will give them to you. Um, and I think the thing to do is to try it for yourself, it's free. Um, get the experience, and then you can see what can be done. For those of you who are not aware, uh, our vice chancellor is doing one himself. Yep. Uh, he's registered on a chemistry MOOC with, Good. with edX, which well, is Harvard MIT. Well, edX is one of the mm. few that offers accreditation, so I should expect to ask to see his certificate. <laughs> 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 So the one of the, I showed you of the 20, the ones I showed yes. you of the 20, yeah, yes. there, yeah there's, there, I've only shown you ones where I know of a, a project that's tried something. Some of them are quite local <laughs> to me, some of them I've done myself, and others are where there's been at least some sort of reflection on practice or evaluation of the student experience. I was wondering whether there, there are some that are more popular now, oh yeah, there are, obviously. That, well, not necessarily particular technology, but in terms of the activities which I'm going to go on to now, wikis have been probably the most popular. Um, but it's changing quite rapidly, actually. Um, so, you know, I don't think you could say just, just one or another. Um, yeah, I, I know it, it's much. Yeah, I'd start. I'd start with trying a wiki or a blog, um, but I'm also quite keen on Twitter and Facebook, using what the students are using, but setting it up for pedagogical purposes. So the place to start is decide what you want to achieve that you can't achieve with your current technology, and then go to the twenty technologies and see which one is most likely to meet your purpose, because therein lies the recipe for success. Okay. <laughs> keep going. How am I doing for time? And you've got uh, some 13, 14 minutes. Right, keep going then. Mm -hmm. So just to say, obviously in terms of organisational structure, 
What's on the left hand side needs a huge amount of organisational development behind it. You know, you're not going to get your upgrade of Blackboard or a new type of organisation without actually engaging the whole institution or significant parts of it. What I gave you on the right, exactly as our colleague here has said, you can do for yourself, you can do small scale prototypes, it's all out there. But do please make sure that you come up with some evidence of, of what worked. And that does mean you need to be clear about what your pedagogical purpose is or what piece of threshold knowledge you were trying to tackle in advance. Um, and so, you know, the way we're, we set it up, you know, at Swinburne is that we've got this observatory, constant observatory going on. And sometimes, I mean, what we're actually doing is moving things around. So we're now at the point where some of what's going on on the right-hand side, we've got sufficient evidence to take it forward to the institution and say we want some structure, we want some support for this. But at least we've done it with evidence to show that it, it's worth doing that. Um, so I just want to say two aspects. When you're trying to adopt some of these technologies for the right-hand side, something you might want to try for yourself and some of you who might not have heard of it before I do write about the pedagogical structures and the role of the online teacher so divide it, di divide it into two mind things one you actually need to get involved in learning design because if you know you do need to design it in advance of the students coming in rather than try and make it up on the fly and then you will need slightly different skills to make the delivery work. And I do strongly recommend you get involved in those two things, even in the lightweight way, you know, to trial something, um, because otherwise you'll find they don't work, and actually you could have made them work if you'd had a bit of learning design and a few skills for delivery. So I use this, it's a five-stage model, um, you can use something else if you like, but this one's pretty tried and tested now. I originally researched it in <clears throat> 1993, so it's been around for quite a long time and it's been developed. So, you know, start with something like this, even if you want to change it or turn it into something else later. Um, you need to design activities so students have regular, frequent <coughs> access and are motivated to continue. You then need to build a culture of working together in teams, because that's what online is good for, rather than delivering of content. You need to help them to learn how to contribute and cooperate. And then you can, and only then, really do the much more difficult and demanding collaborative stuff. But your reward is if you spend a bit of time on the first three, uh, step four will look much better. And step five, you can do your assessment or you can go on and do other forms of development. Now, what you see on the left is the kind of technology help that you need to provide for them. And what you see on the right are the skills of the moderator. The, and that can either be you or it could be someone else. Some of it can be done by alumni or other students. Um, now, when we actually introduced the five-stage model, we then realised we needed small-scale understanding of actually how to build little interaction between students at each stage of the five. Um, and this is to show you how, what you actually need to do, what kind of environments you need to create at each point. Um, and so this is kind of a cartoon storyboard, if you like, of the five-stage model. Um, and you're the person up here is who's called M, is the e-moderator. You can see she's in the role of an angel. We don't think she can be replaced by technology. And here we have our learner starting off on his journey. So at that point, he just needs to be welcomed. He just needs to know who else is there with him but he does need some extrinsic motivation too to come back again and again and again. This is stage two. Um, this is really where you start to build your little online community, whether it's for one activity that's gonna last a couple of weeks or whether it's for a whole degree. 
everyone will bring a bit of baggage with them and you need to build activities perhaps using some of those technologies that I showed you to enable them to feel comfortable with working together and then after you've done that you will be able to get people to exchange known information and some of the contribution sites that I showed you so everyone finds something and contributes to a whole are really really good for doing this um, and then the moderator is still there, but she's probably doing a bit less than she was by this point. And the students are starting <coughs> to become more independent. And when you get to stage five, as uh, four rather, the moderator really needs to continue to design the plan, but to step back and let the students get on with the knowledge construction that's going on. And then one of the great things that you can do if you've had activity of this kind going on online, whether it's blended or entirely digital for distance learning, is that you can look back about everything that's happened. So make sure that all your social media sites are still there and are kept at least to the end of the course. Um, and you can, you know, you've got ready-made revision, um, and you can really start to do your assessment with some confidence in that way. So that's a very rapid run through the model. This is what it actually looks like. Um, and Ali is a past master at this and can help you on it. Um, and you do need to write really good um, instructions for students to take part in whatever media you're using. And that's the kind of structure that you looking for. Um, I'm just going to very rapidly show you the anatomy of an activity. So you need clear pacing so students know when to start, when to finish, where they're coming from, where they're going. Familiar symbols help, you know, so they know, know it's something that they have to do. Single task per message. We're all inclined as academics to put, you know, 30 questions that doesn't actually result in students working together successfully. You can do lots of activities if you like, but just have one task, main task. Always put the purpose of why they're taking part to start with. That's a combination of your learning outcome and what your particular hope is for this activity. Spark to start the dialogue, so your content is there, but it's actually to start student activity it's not the end in itself. Tell them where to respond, and there's two parts to the respond. One, they respond to the spark or the task, and secondly, they respond to each other. And that looks like a blinding flash of the obvious, but if you only remember that from my talk, get them to respond individually and then respond to each other, you'll find the use of bulletin boards or any social media will be much more successful. Um, so that's a response to others. Now, this was that particular activity, what it looked like when people took part. And this is your magic ratio. There are 15 participants. There were 44 messages, only three of them from the staff member. That's what you're aiming for. And when you get good at doing activities, that's what you'll get. So you can clearly see the students are doing most of the work, most of the learning, and you're just putting your feedback and summaries in. So that's the promise, okay, <laughs> if you try this and something to aim for. Um, I think you're pretty good at doing podcasts here and so on, but try and use a little bit of voice um, when you're working online. It adds a, a, a lot of value. <coughs> um, this is the virtual world stuff. I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but we did at Leicester one of our projects, actually test out the five-stage <coughs> model for virtual worlds, immersive environments. Um, it does work just as much. So essentially this basic idea of a scaffold and small-scale interactive activities does translate to very different environments. So have confidence in that. A bit about Carpe Diem. Um, this is the idea that rather than go off and write your course on your own, or if you're lucky with one other colleague, that you design it up front together. And I know this is something that you are going to get introduced here and have the opportunity to be involved in. These, were the, these are the underlying principles that it is a team approach, 
but and you need to actually commit two days of your time so it's very much speed involved um, and it will promote active learning. It will enable you to build into your courses in whatever way you want, the five stage model and the activities. Um, and you should have some confidence that that will transform the student learning experience. This is essentially what it looks like. You write a blueprint first. Um, and if any of you ever come see me in Melbourne, I'll show you the hundreds of blueprints that we have for those uh, Swinburne online courses where we were actually turning all those campus-based courses into entirely digital courses. And then you make a storyboard. That's why I like that table. Do you remember that table? Um, but it's essentially just a matter of moving things around um, right up front, not later, but right up front. And then there's a whole process that you go through where you check out what you've actually designed. Um, this is kind of what it looks like if you do the storyboard on paper using different colours. Um, this is another one that I've done recently. So it can be quite a low-tech approach. Essentially, the topics for an 11-week course are at the top. Then you've got, this was guest lecturers, the dates and the guest lecturers. And then the blue here were the activities. And this was a blended course. Um, so they were, they were once a week also seeing the students. And the little yellow ones were where they did assessment. So this took us probably about a day and a half to design this. No more. And then it looked like that when we tidied it all up. Um, and then it actually went on blackboard only two weeks later and I'm just getting the evaluation in from the students now. So it's something you can do very, very quickly. You know, you don't have to wait until next year before you can deliver this. So if you remember, I said there's two aspects to it. Now, if you design a course in this kind of way, you then need to train uh, someone to provide the human in intervention a light touch who understands what activities offer and understands the five stage model and there's two key things giving feedback through weaving the contributions together and summarizing and giving feedback to close off an activity and move it on to another so you remember I told you storyboards are important Weaving and summarising are important. So if you don't remember anything else from my talk today, I hope you remember that. Um, this is a new report that you might be interested in, the learning curve. Um, an awful lot of people are redesigning courses, you know, to try and increase the university's income. And it, they do matter. Obviously, you need the money to do it. But the culture matters more. So be ambitious, but know that in order to achieve more student income, to achieve more student learning, you are going to have to change what you do. But most importantly is what you do as teachers that really makes the biggest difference. Um, now, just to say, there was a question earlier about the idea of evaluation. We do now have the opportunity to create really big data. So there's a big move um, for something that's called learning analytics. And I've put an article up there called um, Penetrating the Fog, which you might like to read. It's from someone called George Siemens, who's a, a, a forefronter of the, a network approach to learning. Um, and I think if you want to try and understand how the kind of data we're getting from online courses actually does help us to inform a much better learning approach for students, that's a really good article and you might like to have a look at it. Okay, that's it from me. I'll stop for any more questions if I have time. Well, we have time for a couple of questions. Speak one at a time, please. <laughs> <Rob>. <laughs>
Oh, Ron. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm pleased to see that you know some of the technologies I think that you've mentioned already. We've got some of our tutors right. using those already, so that, that's, that's really super, good news. Yeah. Well, thinking about the, the barriers, because while some people are very enthusiastic to, to take on new technologies, either the, um, the tutor, the institution, or the students sometimes put up barriers. What, in your experience, have been the barriers, and how do you do you overcome some right. of those? Um, well, I think you're right to ask about barriers. I think the main barrier is that we'll assume that everything we've done in the university previously um, will be sufficient to transform for a revolutionised, different kind of world. So I think I've kind of answered that by saying you need to, to design for learning. You need to do it in teams. Um, certainly at Swinburne we're not doing any more face-to-face -face workshops. Um, we're not doing a whole range of things that all of us always thought was the best way to do things. So, you know, unless we can see that it's actually going to result in impact on the student learning, we don't do it. So you can imagine how popular I've been on that. You know? But, I mean, those are things we've always done. And, and in a way, they form barriers because we go along to a face-to-face -face <coughs> workshop and then actually it just increases what we individually think we've got to do on our own. Um, so we very much move towards sort of learning design. Um, the other barrier is that we move to teaching online courses and we all <coughs> learn by experience and by apprenticeship what is needed to be done. Um, and we just don't have time for that, you know. We have actually got to <coughs> intervene. That's why with Swinburne Online, we intervene with everyone who learnt to be an e-moderator before we even considered, you know, that they'd be appointed because we knew that they would do it much more happily and in much less time. <coughs> so in a way, I suppose, I'm, a lot of what I've told you is attempting to address the barriers that exist previously. Um, but there's not one thing you can hold up and say, well, if only Northampton did this, we would all be all right. I mean, it's both a collect, it's really a collective <coughs> responsibility. Um, but I'd say, perhaps that is my answer. These are all attempts to overcome the barriers to the way we thought about things previously. Uh, how, how do you train new moderators? Oh, they're entirely online. They have to be in the online environment. Yeah. How long does it take? Oh, uh, 20 hours, four weeks. It can't be done in less than that to get the basics. That's it. Less than that's not good. <laughs> yeah. Because I think, I think when, people ask, when people feel they're not quite sure what they're doing in terms of having the skills to moderate effectively. Yeah, yeah. It's based. It, it, I mean, it's based on what I've told you. The five. So you learn the first stage model, so you understand the notion of scaffolding. The key things are um, the weaving of people's contributions and the summarising. There's obviously other things in there too, um, but you know, people do move forward from that in a much more confident way. We also do now more advanced in moderating for people who've run a couple of modules already. One final one, you be it. Yeah, I just, I was just, I will come to you, Susie. I was just, I was, I was asking people who haven't had a chance to. Uh, yeah. um, I was wondering about when you um, say that the students collaborate. Is it, is it all virtually, or are there opportunities for them to get together and do that physically? Yeah, well? I think there's a complete. Do you, do you mean the Swinburne Online one? I told you, hundred percent digital because they're across Australia. Um, and it is our belief that everything can be done successfully digitally, quite often better than it can be done face to face. Um, but that other one I showed you, this one, um, for example, um, which I'm just getting the evaluation on, um, they already had a weekly tutorial booked for 60 students in a fairly ordinary sort of computer lab um, and they did a mix they had a flipped classroom idea which meant that they put some of their lectures online so that when they were together um, they could do more collaborative work some of the time they were actually doing activities despite the fact there was someone 
across the room and other times they did guest lecturers and so on so they really did sit down and think well how can we best use the face-to-face -face time um, it wasn't really an unplug one thing and plug in the other they rethought the whole thing um, but I said I go back to your purpose why you know if you work out why you want to change it then it becomes fairly obvious what you should do really yeah <laughs> I think we need to stop yeah, now. Okay, thank uh, you very much, yeah. everyone. Can we thank Julie, please?